Uh, his second uh, book, which is titled uh, Fan uh, Food and Fantasy in Early Modern Japan, which was published by University of California Press just last year. Uh, and since it's this subject, uh, dining and daydreaming in the Edo period, um, about which Professor Rath will be speaking today, I'd like, you, uh, I'd like to ask you uh, to help me in, in welcoming him here today without any further ado. Thank you for coming. Oh, what a kind introduction, and it's, it's lovely to be here. I, when I was a graduate student, I always aspired to come back one day, hoped I would be invited back one day to give a talk, a lunchtime talk, because those are so much part of my uh, life as a graduate student at the University of Michigan. And I, I've carried that with me, too. I, anything that I see happening at another university, especially at Kansas, I always measure it by the standards at the University of Michigan, the comments that advisors make, for example, or uh, uh, just how things are done. They're always done, do it properly at Michigan. Why can't we do it like that here? So I, I really appreciate all of your hospitality, and uh, it's just marvelous to be with you today. And, and I do encourage you to eat because you might get hungry, so help yourselves. It looks like you have some wonderful snacks. Uh, my topic today, then, is about dining and daydreaming in the Edo period. And I could say that there are many fascinating aspects. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Good. Uh, there are many fasc fascinating aspects to dining in early modern Japan. These include distinct so styles of serving, which could include multiple trays of food, each with any number of dishes on them. Uh, there are ingredients that you find in menus from medieval and early modern Japan that you would never find in a restaurant or any home today, such as crane or otter. Uh, and you can also find the early beginnings of very familiar Japanese dishes. For example, tempura. If you've ever been to a Japanese restaurant, you know tempura. That was once prepared, originally prepared where you have a fish, you fry it in pig lard, and then you serve it uh, in a dish with broth and some green onions. But I find one of the most fascinating aspects of food culture in early modern Japan to be the degree to which cuisine was a fantasy with food. Cuisine is more than just cooking. Cooking, you know, it's the familiar act of slicing, of boiling, of stewing, of grilling, and other operations that turn these raw ingredients into something to eat. But cuisine is the aesthetic and intellectual appreciation of this creation. As sociologist Priscilla Parkhurst Ferguson explains, quote, cooking gives us food for thought, but cuisine gives us thoughts for food. I think it would require a book to explain how this operated in early modern Japan, the interconnections between food and fantasy, its history, its development from ritual in the medieval period uh, to its uh, expansion through print culture. Uh, I don't have time to talk about that today, but I can recommend a very good book on that topic if anyone's <laughs> interested. So today, I just want to explore a few of the interconnections between food and fantasy uh, by exploring what cooking, eating, and writing about food shared with another imaginative art, namely the art of Japanese poetry. So let's begin first by considering food, and then what people ate, and then consider fantasy. In Kansas, where I live, currently beef is what's for dinner, according to highway billboard signs, at least. And these are hard to see at 70 miles per hour. Uh, the clear message presented is the necessity of beef for the evening meal. But these signs hardly offer a universal definition of dinner or any other meal. In Japan, for one, beef was not widely consumed until the 20th century. We might Instead, imagine a version of such a sign from early modern Japan proclaiming that rice is what's for dinner because the Japanese word for meal, gohan, literally means rice. Yet that statement also needs qualification because only the social and economic elite in pre-modern Japan could dine on white rice. The rest of society made do with brown rice and other grains mixed with beans and vegetables. White rice did not really become a staple until after World War II for most of the population. Of course, there's more to a meal than just a single dish. In an attempt to describe the many factors that define a meal, Mary Douglas offered that meals are composed according to an accepted structure, 
following rules similar to those used for writing poetry. Douglas's analogy resonates well for early modern Japan, where the dominant structure for most formal meals shared several similarities with poetic conventions. These meals are called honzen yori, and literally that means main tray cuisine. That was the dominant style of banqueting from the, for the elite from about 1400 to 1868. In the Edo period, wealthy commoners learned about this style through printed culinary books, and they adopted it for weddings and other celebra celebrations. Honzen dining also inspired the first earliest full meals served in restaurants in Japan, and those opened from the late 17th century. And honzen dining remained the most formal style of eating until the 20th century, and it's still used in parts of Japan today on special occasions as for traditional weddings. Additionally, the components for a honzen meal namely rice, soup, side dishes. Those are the basic elements of a Japanese meal and remain so until after World War II when things become a little more varied. Like Japanese poetry, which joins phrases of five or seven syllables to create long or short poems, the number of trays and dishes on them determine the complexity of a honzen meal. Adding more trays and dishes to a honzen meal made it akin to a more formal waka poem of five, seven, five, seven, seven syllables. While meals of just a single tray with a few dishes run parallel to a simple haiku of just three lines of five, seven, five syllables. Interestingly, honzen meals were often described in a similar shorthand that indicated the number of trays and dishes, providing a measure of the complexity and formality of the meal. Of course, important both to Japanese poetry and to cuisine were seasonal imagery and wordplay. In pursuit of the connection between food and fantasy, we first need to acquaint ourselves with the rules for honzen cuisine, particularly its structure. Then we can briefly sample its aesthetic imagery. While poetry makes imaginative connections with other fields, so does cuisine. And those fields include geography, literature, and humor. Uh, I've used some interesting illustrations here, and maybe if there's time afterwards, I can talk about some of my visual sources and textual sources for this study, if you like. Sitting on the floor rather than on a chair uh, at a table, Japanese since ancient times ate their meals from trays to keep their food off of the ground. Commoners in the 8th century used wooden boards as rests for their simple meals of grains and vegetables. Picture scrolls such as this one, the storybook of hungry ghosts dating from the late 12th century depict aristocrats dining from individual trays that are raised farther off of the ground on a narrow supporting stand. That brought the meal closer to the guest, making it easier to eat. There's a close-up of that. In the subsequent Muromachi period, from about 1400, chefs in the employ of elite samurai served multiple trays of food around a main tray. Here's a delicious looking example. You see why I want you to eat, because you get kind of hungry. Look, that's, that's the one drawback of this line of research. I, I've gained 20 pounds, and I've recently <laughs> shed it. So I'm, I'm worried, because I'm going to continue studying food, and I just have to watch my weight. Uh, in the Muromachi period, chefs in the employ of elite samurai served multiple trays of food around a main tray called the honzen, and they created Japan's first cuisine in the process. These chefs drew upon earlier forms of ceremonial banqueting, employed by the imperial court, uh, and they also used formal rules of behavior following established courtly precedents. According to the rules for creating these banquets, the main tray always has a rice, a soup, and side dishes, and usually pickles and, of course, utensils, namely chopsticks. Sometimes you also have a little toothpick uh, in case something gets caught in your teeth. The honzen also sometimes has salt and vinegar, especially in the medieval period when many dishes are served without condiments, or without flavoring, rather. Each additional tray around the honzen has at least one soup and various side dishes, and these are prepared grilled, raw, or simmered. Besides the quality and the rarity of the ingredients, what differentiated one honzen meal from another was the number of soups and side dishes. And indeed, the, number for, uh, the word for number, okazu, has become synonymous with these various side dishes. Like different types of Japanese poetry that are differentiated by their lines of syllables, honzen banquets came to be described by a shorthand that referenced the number of trays and dishes on them. 
553 or 753. Those were typical formations that indicate banquet member, uh, banquets of three trays each with a soup and corresponding number of side dishes. So each tray has a soup and then there are a number of side dishes with them. Uh, the, si the combination of 753, shichigo-san, which I'm sure you've heard that phrase before, that was thought to be especially uh, auspicious. It's found in other areas of Japanese culture. As you know, the children visit shrines when they're three and five and seven years of age. And if you read the characters differently sh as shime, that means total sum and uh, also has an auspicious meaning. Those trays, the trays are positioned in front of the diner next to the main tray, and they're all served simultaneously. So from the diner's perspective, we have the main tray, and the second tray is to the right, and the third tray would be to the left. And you would sometimes add a fourth tray, but you never call it the fourth tray, because why? Because four is a bad luck number. So you call that the additional tray. And maybe you have a fifth tray behind the third tray and so on. Other trays of food bearing more food could be brought out later for guests to enjoy, but they weren't considered part of the initial calculation of trays and dishes. Banquets featuring three, five, or seven trays for each of the diners were standard, but the number of trays and dishes varies by historical period and according to the occasion. There were also clear rules of etiquette for dining. And they stipulated how you're supposed to eat from these various trays. Clearly, this child hasn't been socialized to this yet. Uh, one noted expert on, Jap on warrior custom, Issei Sadatake, offered a few warnings to us about bad table manners. He called the first mistake soup to soup. And what that meant is you take a sip from one soup on the main tray and then immediately sip a soup on a side tray. The next mistake he called side dish to side dish, meaning you take a one side dish, have a bite out of it, and then pick up another side dish. In other words, what you're supposed to do is have something from a side dish and then have some rice or a soup to cleanse your palate and then go to another side dish. But he had a whole list of these faux pas. One of them was called beyond the tray. And what that meant is if you pass over the main tray to take something on an additional tray to the side. Another one was called corrupt chopsticks. And what that meant is you are constantly eating from the same thing over and over again. Uh, another one that he especially hated was the two-handed beginning. Quote, you take up a rice bowl and chopsticks at the same time when you should really take them up one at a time. I guess you have to put the rice bowl in one hand and then pick up your chopsticks. He says this usually happens at the beginning of the meal and quote, only a moron uses both of his hands at once. Far worse, though, in my mind, is side chopsticks. And that's to turn a chopstick on its side and lick off a grain of rice or a piece of food stuck to it. How many of us have seen that before? Uh, he writes that chopsticks are only supposed to be dampened a little bit at the tips. And that final comment tells us that diners should not shove chopsticks deeply into their mouths or their food, but just use the tips for dining. The fact that these preceding mistakes had names indicates they were common ones and they're still considered bad manners today, so mind yourself. Hmm? Ah. The Honzen meal of all these trays was only one portion of a lengthier session of eating and drinking. Smaller trays of, serve, of, of snacks were served beforehand to accompany sake drinking. And rounds of formal toasting with sake usually preceded a formal honzen banquet. And so much sake was consumed during these initial toastings that usually sake is not served at a honzen banquet. Drinking, though, uh, usually resumes after the banquet. And at that time, there's more food served. You have soups served called atsumono, and that's to differentiate them from the shiru that are the soups served during the banquet. And then later on, you might have uh, noodles, and then if you want tea with some sweets, usually something savory in the medieval period rather than sweet. And maybe you'd have a full-blown meal later in the day. Because after all, I mean, who, who doesn't get hungry after a big meal? Uh, it's like Thanksgiving, you have a big feast, and then later in the day, you're picking at the turkey. This was called in medieval times the after meal, the godan. Conversely, 
uh, the abbreviated form of honzen meals, consisting of just one tray, one soup, and two or three side dishes, that became the simple meals favored by practitioners of the tea ceremony. Accordingly, from a structural standpoint, one could consider tea cuisine to be an abbreviation of honzen dining, since it uses the same components of rice, soup, and side dishes. This type of categorization is evident in the culinary book, Collected Writings on Cuisine and an Outline on Seasonings, Ryori Momoku Chomisho, which was published in 1730. It's a work of, of nearly well, almost a thousand different culinary books that have been published, that were published in the Edo period. These culinary books, rather than document what people actually ate, they suggested what they could eat and how. They provide models for cooking and dining, hence they are a useful source for understanding ideal meal structure. Culinary historian Kawakami Kozo identified several subcategories of culinary books and noted that those featuring recipes and those featuring menus were the two most typical types, especially in the 18th century when this book, Collected Writings on Cuisine and Outline of Seasonings, appears. This book, Collected Writings, can be considered a representative work since it combines two genre, genres of recipe collections and information about cooking. So it has both recipes and more general knowledge about cooking in them. It further included advice about planning honzen meals of different complexity, and that's what I'm going to talk about now. Just as a poet might return to earlier poets' work for inspiration, I'm going to investigate this text to see what sort of inspiration it may have given gourmands of the early modern period. So let's look at its sample menu suggestions. Under the heading of menus, the author of Collected Writings, Shoseki Soken, uh, we don't know much about him or most of these authors, uh, other than what we can glean from their writings. He offered four honzen menus, placing them in order of complexity by season, with spring being the most complicated and winter the simplest. The reasons for this method of organization are uncertain and not specified, but it's a structure found in other genres uh, of writing, including poetry. For example, the first chapters in the 10th century collection of poems, Ancient and Modern, the Kokinshu, these are each dedicated to a season beginning with spring and ending with winter. Just as the poems in these selections could be composed and appreciated all around the year, in collected writings, all four meals could be served year-round with changes in the ingredients, so they were not limited to a particular month of the year. This structuring at first appears odd given the importance of seasonality in modern Japanese cuisine, but if you read Edo period culinary writings, you discover that these authors freely violate the rules of seasonality just because it, it, it's fun to have different uh, things at different times of the year. Appreciating seasonality, in other words, is a very modern concept and uh, was not restricted to specific months of the year in, in Shoseki Ken's time. He prefaces his remarks by noting that he would restrict his comments to the arrangement of the dishes, noting that there were other rules that needed to be follow, followed in creating a menu, but that he would omit talking about these. Rather than explore all the components of a menu, Shoseki Ken concentrated only on their structure, in other words. So here, here are the structures uh, of these menus. We can start at the bottom. That's the winter menu for the tea ceremony. It's a typical abbreviated version of the autumn, men autumn menu, and th that's what he calls typical. When, probably by typical, it means it's something that commoners could eat. And in this period, that commoners were allowed to have two soups, so it's, it's a reasonable menu for commoners to have. Uh, but of course, we have to remember these are ideal menus. They don't rec necessarily represent a reality. For a more auspicious occasion, a banquet, he would recommend the summer menu. That would mean adding another soup, uh, but the number of side dishes, I believe, are the same as for the autumn menu. Looking from the summer menu to the spring menu, we notice a considerable gap from what the commoners could consume in this period and what was available to aristocrats. And this status distinction is highlighted further by the author's obtruse word choice to describe the components of the aristocratic banquet. Turning to these three model menus that he presented later in his book, we begin for the one for spring, and that's what I'm going to analyze today. And that's the only one I have time for, but I can talk more about the other ones if you're interested. 
So let's look at the spring menu and get a sense for the structure of a Honzen banquet. Beginning with its ritual, uh, beginning uh, in a drinking ceremony, the Shiki Sankon. The Shiki Sankon, or the ceremony of the three rounds of drinks, was a formal ritual derived from warrior custom in which participants toasted each other using three cups of sake for each of the three rounds of drinks. So in other words, you're drinking five, or excuse me, nine of these shallow cups of sake for this ceremony, nine at least. Usually it goes on longer than that, so you can see why people didn't eat, need alcohol during the Honzen banquet. Probably pretty loopy by that time. Uh, snacks are served to accompany the sake, but these have largely a symbolic value and they were not consumed. They were instead considered to be lucky tokens. Shoseki Ken noted the basic structure of the ritual, uh, service of sake and snacks before the meal, but he omitted the particulars of the dishes that followed. So we look at his menu and we see we have, have to have a soup, uh, but he says it's something, nani, or something uh, and something, something with something. So he provides us the structure, but it's up to us to fill in the specifics for this. But for the proper banquet, the Honzen banquet that begins, he provides more detail. And what do we have on our main tray? Mm. First of all, it's a fish salad, uh, a mixture of a, of a fish called a half beak. It's a very long and narrow silver fish. Uh, some other seafood there, squid, chestnuts, ginger shoots, kumquat, salt, Japanese pepper. Uh, you need to have pickles on your Honzen, and he includes some here, although he doesn't specify what type. A soup of dark, dark miso, including crane, burdock root, daikon, and uh, some kind of chrysanthemum leaf, and of course rice. This fish dish, the uh, fish salad, the namasu, was a typical dish for the main tray, and it historically was a predecessor to sashimi. Sashimi, you know, is just cut fish. In this case, it's a uh, fish salad usually not accompanied with soy sauce, but with a vinegar dressing and with things like fruit and other kind of seafood mixed in with it. And the example here is a very elaborate one using a fish that was prized in the springtime and other ingredients. In the case here, the crane soup was a delicacy that only high level samurai or the court could enjoy in the early modern period. And if you read the culinary books from the early modern period, there are specific directions about how to serve the soup. And one of the authors advises us that you have to make sure, if you're serving crane soup, to have the leg of a crane sticking out of it. And indeed, if you look at some of the visual depictions of banquets in this period, there'll be a little crane leg popping up out of it. And why is that? And I thought about it. Well, it must be because crane tastes a lot like chicken. And so if you're going to use... Uh, I've never had crane. Has anyone had crane? <laughs> okay, well, maybe someone will prove me wrong. But uh, if you're going to go to the lengths of, of using a crane, you want to make sure that your guests know that you did that. Turning to the second tray, we see raw fish again. There's a sashimi this time, a carp cut into long, thin slices with spiced sake and wasabi, a soup of, of clear broth made of sea bream and citron, and uh, you note uh, throughout this menu, marinated fish are very prominent. They appear on all three trays. The second tray has sashimi, the third tray a marinated fish dish, a marinated abalone and soy sauce, and a lichen called iwatake. Has anyone eaten iwatake before? It, you have? What's it taste like? Okay, well, <laughs> we'll have to talk later about it. It looks a little bit like tree ears to me, but it was considered a delicacy. I'd be curious to, to learn how you got a hold of it. It was considered a delicacy in the Edo period because it grew on mountainsides. And apparently you had to take a rope and rappel down the mountainsides and collect this iwatake and then bring it back and, and serve it. So it was another rare status item. Were it not for the rarity and status of these dishes, one might mistake the first two trays as coming from a commoner banquet. Since the number of side dishes in the first tray, three and one, uh, first and second trays, three and one respectively, those are well within the bounds of sumptuary laws applying to commoners in this period. And it seems also that the salt and the pepper uh, on the first tray are meant to be one of the ten side dishes, which would seem to lend an air of modesty to the banquet. But since we have a third tray and a fourth tray, it's clearly a banquet meant for nobles. Only the upper reaches of warrior society, such as members of the shogun senior council, could legally sit down to a third tray of food at a banquet. 
Additional trades were the preserve of people of even higher status, namely the shogun and members of the imperial court. So what's on these third and fourth trays? The third tray has a plate of marinated fish, salted salmon with flakes of preserved bonito. Oh, I, found like, I feel like a television cook. Uh, soup is made of rice bran, leafy greens, and freshwater clams. And a, there's a plate of dark soy sauce marinade uh, consisting of abalone, kumquats, and this iwatake lichen. The diners here are also served a fourth tray, and this is called the added in back tray. This tray is more often called the included in back tray, the mukozume, uh, since it was located behind the main tray. It wasn't counted as a fourth tray because it lacked a soup. Instead, it was used to contain additional grilled foods. So what do we have here? We have a grilled sea bream simmered in soy sauce with a little ginger, a plate of simmered duck with dropwort and enoki mushrooms. I think it's a little green, like a... Uh, like a leaf, little green, er herby, green, green thing. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know how else to describe it. Um, skylark, fish cake, dried cod that's been grilled, and pickers, pick, uh, pickles. And the, the text says pears, which seems like a strange thing to pickle for me. Uh, but if I uh, read more uh, into the literature, apparently pears was a shorthand. Nashi uh, also meant nashimono, which is a salted fish intestine, which was considered a delicacy. Nice otsumame with sake. And uh, arrowhead, kuai, in spicy miso. But the banquet continues. Uh, I, I don't have time to talk about it today. He also has an after meal that he provides people, a godan, and then another banquet later in the day for the aristocrats. Plus, he further appended an additional meal of two trays and three side dishes with these wonderful uh, culinary displays called shimadai. These inedible displays are mentioned only in passing in his menu, but they're well known from other culinary works. The first he lists is a spiny lobster. And to make this dish, a chef would have to take the lobster's feelers and twist them around so it looked like a little boat. So we have lobster in the shape of a boat, ise ebi funamori. The second dish was cooked snipe. And for some reason, my undergraduates, when I ever talk about snipe, they always chuckle, and I'd like to know the reason why. Here, this snipe is uh, served with its feathered wings reattached. The bird was, had its wings removed, it was cooked, and then the wings were reattached, and usually uh, it was positioned so the bird looked like it was going to fly away. In this instance, it looks like it's already flying. Uh, he also provides another uh, of these display dishes called awabi no kaimori, which is abalone served on its shell with decorative elements like paper streamers around it. All three dishes were specialties of chefs called hochonin in the employ of the aristocratic and military elite. And if you have these dishes at a banquet, then it must have been a very grand affair. The stages set forth in the banquet for aristocrats included uh, indicate the rhythm of a full banquet. Like a long poem, the banquet linked together different segments, each with their own meter. We start with the shikisankon, the three rounds of drinks, followed by the honzen meal of three or more trays of food, followed by additional numbers of, of, of snacks to accompany the sake after the banquet. As Shoseki Ken demonstrated in his examples, a banquet could be lengthen lengthened further with the supplement of an after meal and even additional two tray meal uh, later in the day too. Given the constraints of sumptuary laws and financial means, the long form the of this banquet, the one described here, was something commoners and most samurai could only appreciate by reading about it. They had to content themselves with shorter forms when they created their own meals for special occasions. So here's the idea that this cooking art was something really, something that was a fantasy. It was a literary art. By grouping complex aristocratic banquets together with less sophisticated menus, the author of collected writings illustrated that honzen meals share a basic structure, a fact that resonates well with Mary Douglas's more general observ observations about meals. Mary Douglas writes, quote, each meal carries something of the meaning of other meals in it. And she continues, quote, each meal is a structured social event which structures others in its own image, end quote. So it did not matter whether or not Shoseki Ken's readers could actually prepare the complex aristocratic banquet 
or the others, since they could still read and daydream about that meal and appreciate its complexity and perhaps even gain some inspiration to bring to the creation of an actual meal and judge the outcome. Shoseki Ken's menus are closer to an ideal than a reality, in other words. So as we have seen, part of the elegance of a Honzen meal was its adherence to a set structure. Yet, some of the most artistic and fantastic aspects of the meal were those that brought to focus specific parts within that structure. In the same way that literary devices like alliteration, metonymy, and wordplay call attention to specific words within a poem. Flavor, color, aroma, as well as the rarity of the dishes, the quality of the preparation, and flair of presentation could draw attention to any dish. But a literary comparison is especially apt in the early modern period, when there developed a fondness for foods with poetic names. We find sweets, for example, with the names Autumn Field, Misty Moonlit Night Rice Cake, Card Game Cake, among many others. Poetic food names evoked references to noted places, famous people, and natural phenomena. Where does this come from? The custom of applying poetic names to foods existed since the turn of the 16th century, and it is found first in Japanese confectionery. The last two decades of the 17th century witnessed a profusion of these artistic names and coincided with the rise of the confectionery business. Sweet makers used a greater number of names in this period to create a wide variety of products from the same basic ingredients, using the same things over and over again. Nonetheless, they're able to make a huge array of sweets. Now, what are those things? Refined sugar, rice flour, and adzuki bean paste. Of course, size, shape, design motifs, and coloration could be used to create different sweets, but what sets them apart is the name. Confectioners, of course, turned to their chief customers, tea masters and aristocrats for these names. The Kyoto sweet maker, Toraya, uh, which served as a purveyor to the court since the late 1500s, claims today that more than 50 of its sweet names come from emperors or members of the aristocracy. Poetic names for dishes are found scattered in several culinary books, but two works that take these as their primary focus are by an author named Hakuboshi. These are delicacies from the mountains and seas, an anthology of special dishes, published in 1750 and 1764, respectively. I had to throw this slide in, too, because it shows no actors with food headdresses, and I just love it, although it's not a part of this talk today. Uh, like most cookbook authors, the biographical information we know about Hakuboshi comes from his texts. And in the preface of his second book, he identifies himself as living in the eastern part of Kyoto and proficient in the ways of cooking. Both books are organized into five volumes and contain 230 recipes each in no apparent order. The recipes themselves are easy to make. They amount to just a few sentences each. But what their charm is, is their imaginative names. So one section can serve as a sampling of both works and of the ways in which poetic names could transform even simple dishes into something artistic. The third volume of Anthology of Special Delicacies begins, as other volumes do, with a table of contents. Of the 46 dishes in this section, approximately half have poetic names, descriptive of more than just their principal ingredient or cooking technique. Uh, these poetic dishes include Teika's rice, blue sea tofu, chrysanthemum leaf setting, pine cone tofu, Mount Fuji salad, kimono sleeves, imitation truffles, day and night yams, three day pickling, Genji persimmons, twisted sea bream, ise tofu, blinded rice cakes, Uji river, foreign yuba, Buddha's name soup, grilled akita pinks, moss simmer, Japan salad, and hailstone tofu. The dishes listed here take their names from varieties of sources. Teika's rice, for example, is in homage to the Kamakura period, Fujiwa, Kamakura, uh, Kamakura period poet Fujiwara no Teika, editor of the new collection of ancient poems, the Shin Kokinshu, and a noted commentator on the Heian period classics, Tosa Diary, and Tale of Genji. The Genji persimmons here, 
That's a tempura recipe named after the Genji or Minamoto warrior's battle flag, which was white and said to resemble the color of the fried persimmons in the recipe. The blue sea of the tofu dish is actually taken from the name of an ancient court dance of the Bugaku tradition. Mount Fuji salad, Ise tofu, Uji River, foreign yuba, grilled Akita pinks, and Japan salad all reference geographic locations. Other dishes are visual puns. So if you sit down to a dish called pine cone tofu or moss simmer, you're not going to find their featured ingredients. Instead, they rely on other foods to give the appearance of these, similar to dishes like imitation truffles, hailstone tofu, and of course, the dish Uji River. Now, what could, what could symbolize the Uji River? That's simply some dumplings made from rice and yams. So you see, you really have to have imagination here to, to appreciate these dishes. Comparable visual puns include the dish kimono sleeves, which evokes the appearance of a snow-covered robe. And we do that by taking a scrambled egg and putting it on top of tofu. <laughs> Buddha's name is soup is my favorite. It's a pun on the main ingredients. The fish here is called a kanagashira. And that's uh, a play on words for the word kane, or bell. And if you think about when people chanted the name of the Buddha, they rang a bell. And so, nice, nice pun there. Dishes such as these add punctuation to a honzen meal, particularly for commoners who could not afford to have multiple trays of exotic foods. Accordingly, this text resembles a poetic catalog of vivid imagery mixed with a bit of dog roll that awaits a poet chef to incorporate into a larger structure. Poems may qualify as waka or haiku if they have a requisite number of syllables, but they will still fail as an art without a sensitive use of words. Similar rules underlay the creation of the formal style of dining called honzen cuisine in late medieval and early modern Japan. These meals required an adherence to both structure and to a sensitive use of ingredients and careful creation of dishes, similar to the mindful selections of words for a poem. Of course, knowing these rules may not have completely answered the question of what was for dinner, since honzen meals were only served on formal occasions. Yet, those who mastered these rules would know what to expect and what to take delight in and when they sat down to their banquet trays. Culinary rules, just like those governing the creation of poetry, were initially restricted to the elite in the medieval period, but through the growth of the publishing industry, they became more widely known in the early modern period. Though, people, though more people were able to read about elaborate meals, few actually had the necessary social status and economic means to be able to partake of the most elaborate ones. Yet, of course, that did not stop readers from the vicarious enjoyment of reading and daydreaming about food. And it would not prevent humble chefs and diners from drawing connections between their modest menus and the more elaborate culinary masterpieces of higher status groups. So my paper has revealed the critical role of the imagination and of texts in the creation of cuisine in early modern Japan. This creative process of daydreaming about food that we explored together today helps explain the rise of modern Japanese cuisine, which joins food habits to the imagined community of the nation. My talk has also illustrated what modern Japanese cuisine has lost, despite the fact that it is more widely available. And in some ways, that's good, because who wants to eat crane or sea otter? <laughs> so thank you very much for your attention.